So our world's in big trouble, and uh, some of the biggest fish in the world are following uh, due to pollution, and it's a terrible thing, so uh, please try and keep our waters clean. Uh, please subscribe. Other shows from Fly Fishing Dodd Species will be covered. And uh, for the first 1,500 subscribers, a draw will be held, and one will win 10 design flies uh, from myself that uh, I designed that you cannot find anywhere else. So uh, uh, the show's going to begin there in a second. And uh, anyways, uh, stay tuned. we got a wild adventure. You're going to see some uh, pretty decent urban fish uh, uh, through the series there, some real monsters to uh, lots of just, yeah, yeah, you know, decent quality sort of fish. And we cover all kinds of techniques and different things like that but this uh, first show is for basically the people that view my sort of mystery sort of things as well if you do have uh, any uh, big uh, whopper fish stories or anything like that you can uh, uh, certainly uh, contact me and uh, I'll leave a, a, a link somewhere there to contact in the description box and that sort of thing like that but uh, you can certainly contact me if you have any uh, fascinating water sort of tales I've been uh, investigating uh, that uh, subject for uh, you know near six decades now around the clock and uh, so a long long time I'm one of the earlier sort of mystery sort of guys out there and uh, I had interactions with lots of sort of other people that were involved with this sort of thing and uh, so and I, I fished hundreds of uh, lakes that had reported lake monster lakes in them and I have a book coming out about this sort of subject and uh, I've been you know worldwide at a sort of like uh, nobody else ever done this sort of thing where I, they fished hundreds of sorts of lakes with lake monsters in them and checked the fishing and, and sort of thing like this. So my book's a one of a kind because it also mentions sort of, I wanted to investigate, is it feasible that a large creature has enough food in there and all these sorts of things. So I cover a lot of sort of things in the books as well. So uh, uh, whenever that's released there, uh, I'll give you a notice on here as well. So so anyways, uh, stay tuned and let the uh, show begin. A bit of history and a few baits there 
and uh, fan casting uh, around the clock. I, I wasn't, uh, because I had to cut down some of the sort of films here, There, I, I had problems with the, a set, uh, two of these sort of cameras. They're weird and they don't, and because it was all done on a dollar store budget, sometimes these things would just shut off instantly or do weird sort of things. So uh, in one of the parts there, I was trying to explain about a fan casting and that uh, basically what I call it around the clock is basically what we're doing here most of the time except I'm not really doing that because I'm so familiar with the water I'm more being specific but typically when you go down to a sort of any area that you're fishing right the fish have to be from top to bottom and they have to be somewhere in some kind of trage trajectory that you can sort of reach in that spot so each area you cover a certain sort of section, right? You cut them out like pies. And now you sort of start at 12 o'clock. So you cast right straight in front of you, then one, two, three, four. But now what they don't mention is there could be under sort of cover banks that are underneath you, undercut banks, things like that. There could be uh, fish along the edges of the banks and that if you notice a lot of professional bass fishermen, they're always casting to bank, yet you see everybody from shore casting halfway out in the lake, right? That's a no-no. <laughs> There's all kinds of fish that may be right beside you, sort of to the left or right of you. So besides the typical like sort of five o'clock trajectory and the six, you sort of more of a scrape in between the sort of like the four, the five, right, directly left and right of you, right? And that sort of thing. So cover all the trajectories with everything from a surface lure to the deepest diving kind of lure that you have on you, right? Sort of thing. Or especially if you have jigs, even if they're lighter, eventually it'll get down there. You just count it down, right? You figure out the depth of how uh, it's sinking. Same with spitter baits or any kind of baits that are sinking. You count the speed of what it does per uh, sort of foot if you can guess by a foot if it takes a second as a instance, now you know you open up your bail you keep loosening out the slack watch though is it sinking this is another trick for you because if it stops or does anything strange it's likely that there's a fish on it or something's now stopped it could be cover or different sort of things whatever it is you need to be aware of it soon and so now you need to tighten up on this and uh, ascertain whether it's a fish or not but don't ascertain too long it's better to take a chance and set the hook you might think it's a snag but it might be the monster of a lifetime right and that sort of thing like that so that was something i did want to sort of uh, cover in there that uh I'd uh, sort of uh, missed out, but uh, also uh, figure eighting, I didn't need to do that whatsoever. So we'll cover that in a future musky show and that sort of thing like that. And uh, but today's adventure, it's behind the uh, uh, historic Ottawa River here. We're going to be fishing on uh, behind the famous Parliament buildings. We've had everybody from uh, UFOs to uh, uh, a werewolf man that lived up there, <laughs> and uh, 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 prime ministers doing seances. So lots of wacky sort of uh, uh, things go on uh, uh, around that sort of area. We've had all kinds of people peeped off at uh, the different uh, you know politicians from uh, Trudeau, et cetera, right? And uh, they'll go down there and yell at him and that sort of thing like that, including the werewolf man. <laughs> so so we're going to be uh, fishing uh, down here uh, in this basin sort of uh, region here. It's uh, now quiet for the season. The locking stopped for the season, right? And it just stopped. And this sort of thing, this is the Bytown Museum, Colonel By, he was the guy that created the canal. And the canal goes from here all the way to Kingston and that sort of thing. It reaches the Otto River, also can touch the Great Lakes going the other way. So all kinds of strange things can get in it. We had a report of a 90-foot mahogany sea serpent that actually swam in it twice. And these characters were so none thinking here all the workers had to do was shut the locking doors you could have trapped the dude and drained the water right and we would have had the mystery solved no people would be believing in sea serpents because a whole crew of the canal sort of workers saw this thing coming in one time and a ship guy with all his entire staff and they wrote affidavits and everything i was came from lake ontario right and lake ontario has had massive lake monster sightings over the uh, ages they're random right because 
it's such a big body of water, the odds of you seeing the monster at that time is kind of slim, right? But on the show here, we're going to cover uh, an extinct, possibly uh, ESOC species that actually has extremely good evidence for it inside of a museum. Uh, and all kinds of things, uh, historic photos of it and this sort of thing that will blow your mind that a monster pike, a killer pike actually existed amongst us and may still in Ireland and a, a few other countries over in uh, Europe and that you get these wacky tales still of 10 foot plus sort of pike monsters and in Canada, even in a few lakes in Quebec and uh, different places, Lake Iliamana, uh, different ones, right? And that sort of thing like that around the world. So uh, very intriguing. We'll talk about that, more about that uh, sort of uh, uh, after uh, but the reason why I did this is, is just to show you now, this is extremely rarely clean here, but usually it's loaded full of garbage, right? And that sort of thing because of the higher population, way more tourists, way more people and that. And they removed the garbage cans. There used to be two garbage cans per bench along this water system. And this accounts everywhere. It doesn't matter where it is. It could be the farthest lake in Russia, wherever. I'm just more specifically talking about this one, but it matters everywhere. It's all the same, right? And, and the thing is, is that uh, instead of put, uh, the mirrors got cheap, they didn't want to pay for uh, sort of uh, the workers that uh, ran this NCC, this canal sort of system. They didn't want them to continue doing it. So they subcontracted it out to another province. The guys only come by once in a while and they're not like they used to be every day with two garbage cans per bench. Now it's one garbage can every four or five benches sort of idea. Yeah, you know, depending on the spot, there is a few areas where there's two garbage cans, but it, they're extremely rare. So, so the thing is, is that because of this and and renting of canoe and paddle boats and five billion things, the and every weekends we have these sort of, uh, uh, you know, charity events of all different sorts. Everybody gets a free granola bar. Now all the granola bars are in the water, right? And the fish that I show you that, yeah, you know, from going down here as a kid, reeling an eight, 10 sturgeon in an afternoon, sometimes mixed in with 30, 40 other assertions of fish, not including the carp here. Right? I've been fishing for carp since the sixties. I made my empire that and winning tournaments. Uh, by uh, selling to Asian and different restaurants, Pakistanians and all. I had dozens and dozens of clients and every day I takes a specific amount of hours, which didn't take long to reel in between 20 to 50 carp that I'd be selling them. And they were this numerous. I have one every second. The second I put down a bait, hundreds of fish going by you constantly, everything. This was before the zebra bustles, right? And the introduction in that. All kinds of fish, you'd catch a giant muskie one cast, a giant walleye, then a school of saugers, then moon eyes, uh, then quillbacks, <laughs> then sturgeon, right? right? Like, I mean, the, these fish would just go in circles and all kinds of species and monsters man, because almost no people could fish the river that was loaded full of logs that was being logged. No pollution except the odd character drunk guy throwing in a case of beer or something, like not too much, right? Almost no boaters. Five million minnow species flying everywhere, jumping. The second you cast your lure in the water, they would fly up the whole sky, like just water system would cover with minnow splashes, right? Like like instantly you throw out a net, you had a, a hundred, several hundred sort of minnows here and up bait for all day, right? There was a funny guy that was here that would bump in the 60s and 70s and he was actually the only sort of, uh, I guess, like fishing like hobo I've ever seen to a certain degree. I've seen other ones, but I mean, this, this guy was very specific he actually had this tin cup and he would come along like this every time and he had all these hand lights and that sort of thing like that and he'd be trying to catch catfish or different ones right and and the the uh and the the, the guy would come up with this little tin can when he'd see a get a big scoop of minnows and he'd say minnow minnow please give me minnow like this and the guy would do this every day he'd never like bum change or different things that you would think right but you could tell he he liked the booze because he kind of yeah yeah you know smelled a bit boozy right so maybe he's uh drinking lots of sake or something i'm not sure where he was really from he had an unusual sort of 
mixture to him where he might have been sort of a couple of races here of some sort, like Asian and some other sort of similar one, right? Sort of mixed together. But but anyways, really funny guy. Uh, but but uh, this uh, Bytown Museum here is supposed to be haunted as well, uh, sort of thing like that as a side note and that sort of thing. So besides the werewolf of the Parliament building and the uh, 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 the scary loneliness monsters, so <laughs> these different ones, uh, we're going to be out here, uh, uh, you know, hunting for uh, e, e socks and that sort of thing like that, and covering uh, spitter baits and suix uh, a little bit and that sort of thing like this on this uh, particular shows. But as the shows go along, I cover all kinds of different things from uh, plastic worms to uh, uh, crank baits, you name it. Like uh, as the series goes along for multi species of fish, but but it's a shame to seeing like consistently every day where you think a bad day of fishing is 40 or 50 fish to now having to walk miles to barely see little groups of carp and all these kinds of things of really lots of species from wild goldfish uh, uh, crappies have went down and not not in the Ottawa River so much but because there are certain areas that are, uh, that's quite loaded with them but but uh, in in the canal system there they never were like massively packed but but I used to be able to get like dozens here sort of thing like that but that now you got to really work for them their lower supply because of the weed growth what happened the zebra mussels changed all this made massive weed growth it didn't uh it might have helped the pike a little bit not that much it's that you catch about the similar sort of abouts and that and same with muskies and that for some reason they always did well one way or the other sort of thing and a lot of them would filter through from here right sort of thing they'd get up the locking system and get trapped into the canal and occasionally you'd get a real monster one right like late 50 inches early 60 inch sort of one that got in there from time to time right over the sort of thing but but the the thing is, is that back then you had no weeds, the fish had harder time to see the minnows and everything and all that sort of thing like that. But then the second that the uh, cleared this up, the largemouth population, it used to be a hundred smallmouth, you'd catch one largemouth in the canal, not in the Otter River, that's a totally different sort of thing. And some of them would swim up into it, some years you'd get more. But, but the thing is, is that typically, because there was no cover there much for them and uh, very uh, not too much sort of thing except this uh, artificial gravel sort of uh, humps that they put out on there and sort of things like that. There wasn't a lot of sort of typical cover except the odd bridges or the odd dock or the odd sort of thing, but not much, right? So they didn't do as well and there wasn't that great of areas to spawn in that, but smallmouth did better. So now you catch like a hundred largemouth, maybe seven to 10 smallmouth. So the smallmouth have declined in a lot of spots because they're sort of a now in major competition with some of these other ones. The water's crystal clear and all the baby carp fry that used to survive now don't. The second that they're born, almost all of them are eaten very quickly, right? And this sort of thing is same with minnows or sucker species or the different ones. So please, whatever you're doing again, don't be throwing foreign species in there. Please don't throw your garbage in the waters. Uh, garbage is for garbage cans, okay? So anyways, uh, we'll, we'll continue on with the show and, uh, and uh, you'll see a lot of historic things, like I said, covered through the different shows. Uh, bye for now. Oh, and uh, uh, one other sorts of uh, uh, things there. Uh, the next show it'll be. I, I I'm not sure if I had actually said this. Or not. <laughs> I was just stopping, and I thought if I hadn't said that, that I'm going to be covering the history of bass fishing and lots of legends and how they affected me and all kinds of different things and uh, uh, lots of different coverage of different bass lures from uh, uh, spinner baits to plastic worm families, crank baits, buzz baits, uh, spoons, all that sort of thing. So stay tuned here below the parliament buildings uh this uh, as i had mentioned has all kinds of wild sorts of uh wild fish and creatures that might be floating by but uh, right now we're uh fan casting uh basically different areas although i'm not really fan casting because i'm so familiar with the area but 
I'm casting different trajectories here and fluttering down a homemade dollar store component spinner bait mostly with a Boro blade and uh, a couple of hooks and different sorts of things to design this bait which I've been making since the uh, about 74, 75 and the in between those two years uh, sort of thing like that. Uh, and uh, making these giant homemade ones for muskies and pike and uh, bass, walleyes and all kinds of species. Uh, I won by the mid 70s already, uh, let me see, uh, saugers, walleyes uh, many, many times, uh, northern pike massive tons of times, large mouth and small mouth massive tons of times already by this point. Uh, with uh, homemade spinner baits uh, mostly and early ones anyway from uh, Shannon twin spins old rocker arms beetle spins ones like that and I would modify them put anything from pieces of shower curtain uh, uh, rubber bands you name it uh, 10 million sorts of things uh, that I uh, use right and that sort of thing so I'd uh, try and experiment a lot of different things, but uh, what we're doing today with this uh, homemade sort of bait here uh, and uh, also the uh, silicone skirts and liver rubber from old pieces that were broken, I modified this and tied them on and that. And in my books, I cover all kinds of how to do these kinds of things and everything else and different shows, I'll show you different sorts of things. But right now I'm uh, sort of fan casting like sort of a, a thing and uh, working different trajectories here and letting it flutter down in deep holes and sort of crawling along the uh, bottom or as uh, some call it slow rolling things like that and uh we're uh, i'm also uh, just just because it's early in the morning uh, i'm going slower faster trying different things there could be fish up on the surface muskies are wild it could be 100 feet of water and yet he's suspended right up near the top because they may be chasing uh, moon eyes, uh, fall fish, different sorts of ones, walleye, saugers, different things that may be suspended up in the water column. And uh, so the, they'll attack these sort of things. So we'll cover this for uh, a little while and that sort of thing. And then uh, after then we'll alternate back to an old suic, an old bait from the later 60s, I think it was 68, 69, I started using them, just the second they came out, I, I don't remember if it was 68, 69, somewhere in there, but late 60s, I was just a little kid, and uh, I, I would also, after that, even I was uh, lucky a lot of times, sometimes these old retired guys would buy these sort of giant plugs or had really older ones before, sort of suics, other swords that were yeah you know similar like like big giant old wooden plugs you know of different sorts and these guys would pass on and i was a charming little kid so i'd go along and to these garage sales <laughs> and hit them before i'd go out fishing sometimes on a, a sunday if i could uh, hit these garage sales uh, and if i seen in the paper that they mentioned there was fishing stuff so i'd be able to talk these guys down to uh, a fair amount of low cash <laughs> and and uh, uh, one one lady uh, uh, it was uh, unbelievable she gave me about this guy used to be a guide in uh, sort of over in Minnesota and they'd moved into Canada and stayed there for ages and this guy had tackle boxes loaded full of old sort of musky baits of all sorts of uh, even some homemade ones so this guy was like me sort of like uh, but you know way older sort of thing but uh, he, he was a guide and that sort of thing out in Minnesota someplace and uh, this, uh, he had like about five musky rods uh, with some walleye rod, all kinds of stuff. And this lady gave me all of it for, for like 40 bucks, man. It was the most uh, astonishing buy ever. <laughs> so, so, and uh, some of these things, trivia, who made the Lindy rig? Uh, was it uh, Larry Linden? Jim Lindo? Larry Dahlberg? Ron Azumi, Arthur Fonzarelli, <laughs> Ron Lindner, or Tito Lindner. Do, 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 Three, two, one. <laughs> and the answer is Ron Lindner, uh, legendary, uh, the Lindner family. 
uh, founders of the uh, Inn Fishermen and uh, uh, one of the most extraordinary angling family you could find across the globe for sure and that sort of thing like that so anyways we'll get back to the show there but we'll have these different sort of uh, uh, puns one and of course uh, I'll put in some uh, silly ones mixed in with it so anyways uh, uh, stay tuned and uh, we'll continue on and uh, uh, get some uh, fish Oh, hi folks there, uh, there's a uh, nice uh, northern pikey there on the ED, so uh, the musky show is continuing, although that's not a musky, but it's a, a, actually a fat, nice northern pike there. This is a big lure, eh, so it's like a 17-inch long lure, so I don't know if you can see, but it's a fairly decent pike, and a lot of people would find that big for around this region. So anyways, uh, we'll continue on the show, and let's see what's happening. Bye for now. A strange uh, morning there, folks. Uh, sunny, no wind, then it was windy, then no, no wind again. Uh, and like these little fronts just kept going through. It would last for like about an hour, then it'd be all dead still, then all of a sudden the wind would pick up again and back and forth. So sadly, the first round there, uh, uh, when we were fixing this, uh to put them together right we tried to crop off some extra areas that was just hanging out that wasn't necessary there right sort of thing and sadly it wrecked the original sort of one so the first so many minutes of casting you don't see that much but as the rounds continue it, it uh we were able to improve on that just a couple of them for some reason even the muskie that i was fighting with uh, a couple of them got messed up for cropping too much but <laughs> that's uh, you know it's one of those things but very strange morning anyways but now we're going to go for a coffee break and uh, go up and uh, that sort of thing like that we uh, lost uh, sadly the camera shut off uh, the uh, the first muskie it was on this side earlier in the sort of thing but what we got our first one for the second round coming back with the uh, sort of suic and that sort of thing like that so but uh, the other one was a, a, a sm even a smaller one so sort of thing but but we got that cut off. I have a picture of it sideways, uh, like as a side thing. I get, I suppose I could put that in a the sort of at the end or something. But anyways, uh, uh, but we'll continue on with the show here. So uh, it's just, it, it was a learning experience, like I said, because this one was weird. You're doing all about the the garbage and the pollution all these different sort of things so it's, it's not a straight sort of just teaching video sort of thing right so it's a bit of mixture of stuff so I, I, a couple of them got messed up but, but anyways we'll we'll continue on here and uh, you'll see some uh, uh, nicer fish here uh, coming up but uh, that was a big one there oh uh, by the way uh, uh, on the uh, sort of thing i mentioned there was 17 inches that's 17 inches folded in and sort of thing like that not 17 inches long however i make some even much longer than that but this particular model it's like 17 inches of wire that i was using right sort of thing like that and but when you fold it down of course now that's about half of that right and that sort of thing like that but uh, a, a pretty decent bike anyways to uh, start off the round and that sort of thing so we'll continue on but it's a lot better right now because this morning was really sunny and that sort of thing and now it's a nice chop and uh, this is when the big monsters hit so if there is a giant around let's hope this round we get it <laughs> oh give me a home where the giant musky roam so I'll get uh, cast this uh, shorter uh, version of a dollar store homemade giant spinner bait that I've been making since the mid 70s, like I said, so a long time. So we're gonna let her flutter down, let her flutter down. It's more likely we'll have fish nearer to the surface as the day warms up. But it all depends on how many fish are sort of around, right? This place is extremely random. <sighs> But we just have a better shot now if some had moved in or that weren't sort of active right that minute. So you think we have a better shot now with this sort of conditions. So as I was showing you there, spinner baits and jigs are very similar in the sense that you can work them. A lot of people don't do that, but I do. I use the jigs even up on the surface. You can scooter them along and that sort of thing. 
Uh, oh, and it's the same sort of process. I mean, uh, there's only, the fish has to be somewhere from the top to the bottom. So if you don't have a depth finder with you and you're fishing for sure, you just have to check out all the sort of areas and see which one you first get a reaction on. And then if you've checked everything, then you move the families of baits and you keep working down until you get something, right? The older you get and the more wisdom you have, the longer you've been fishing, the quicker you'll know which one is likely going to work most of the time better so you're not spending a quarter of your day wondering. That's where experience comes in, right? Sort of thing like that. Ooh. But it's a beautiful day. Uh, right now, if it stays like this and not like blast rain, sort of thing like that, I always bring my two coats there. I got a, another one underneath there. I had, had that on at first, and now I'm back to this, and uh, it's back and forth. <laughs> but I kind of sweat in these a little bit. Oh. Well, I don't see too many hardcore guys out here today. <laughs> sort of, oh, now I'm not hitting right on the edges over there yet. I, I have a particular way of doing things. And so we're letting it flutter down, let it flutter down. The wind's nice here. Oh, give me a home. Where the Chinese socks mask and age roam. And world record, the pomus macrocheris are floating around all day. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word. And the sad prettiest carpios are biting on my line today. Home, home on the ridge. Where the deer are eating all the garbage today. <laughs> so, it's very difficult to figure this out exactly what's the best sort of... Okay, there, now I can see the bank a little bit better. It's really hard to do this on uh, this budgetary thing. I need a camera lady or guy or something. <laughs> That's what I need. Okay. Uh, oh. So it's terrible when you're working a few spots with only so many dollar store like baits. Eventually, you start burning them out even when the conditions are right because those other fish that hit might have even just hit quicker, faster, right, like right on the first gas or anything in this while it's like this now, right? <sighs> Oh, let it flutter down, flutter down, flutter down. Ooh, let it flutter down. So, we're just barely a now. Ooh, there we go, folks. So there's another one there. He's uh, going around all over the place. Do, 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 do. So anyways, uh, I'm going to have to shut off the camera because we're almost out of space here. And if we get another one, I don't want to... Lose a photograph fiber now. What balsa plug from Finland has caught more trophies than any other similar baits? The macho plug? The evil uh, uh, devil jersey horse? <laughs> the uh, rebel pop R? I should have put in the, or the Zell Roland, I guess. <laughs> or the Rapala. Do, 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 do. And the answer is Rapala by Lori Rapala. And uh, uh, what a legendary lure. I, I started using these in the 60s. I caught my biggest smallmouth uh, in my entire life, an 8-pound, 3-ounce smallmouth with a blue and silver Rapala. 
uh, I couldn't the amount of sort of different trophies that I got in different contests and things using them as sort of partial part of the tournament or the full tournament sort of uh, uh, winnings or different sorts of things and multi species of fish from uh, uh, walleyes to smallmouth, largemouth, uh, you know, the list goes on, saugers and uh, uh, anything from trout to salmon, you name it. <laughs> they all hit them. So that, that guy's my hero, Lori Rapala, uh, a big, big time. Uh, this guy started carving them uh, and uh, uh, he started producing them there in the later 30s. And uh, uh I mean, just the most astonishing sort of a lure that, you know, and uh, certainly a staple for many Canadians that, uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, many Canadians and Americans uh, have a rapple in their tackle box, right? So, so but anyways, uh, we'll continue on now. Uh, sadly, when we tried to put these in, uh, because it's a different parts of shows and things, they weren't filmed exactly the same, and, and uh, you had two cameras going back and forth, so the odd little sort of a clip out mistake uh, happened here when we were uh, sort of trying to crop and it was <laughs> the, the next show we figured out what these little things are but 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 anyways we'll, we'll continue on right that sort of thing now we've switched baits and we're going to be hunting with a suic here and I'm actually going to hunt with suics up for walleyes in the canal later. So uh, how do you like those for apples, eh? You wouldn't think of that, would you? <laughs> However, we're, we're going to try and see if we can get one uh, sort of a musky here. The season's sort of closed down now here, these uh, locking system. And uh, this is uh, the historic, like I said, Ottawa River here. And uh, what we're doing here is an old trick I've been using since a little kid. I call it... Uh, well, we used to call it different names that we <laughs> that probably wouldn't be too popular nowadays. But anyway, let's call it you know low budget trolling. We'll call it something like that, right? Sort of idea. So I think you get the drift here. And uh, basically, what you'd be doing is uh, you walk along this. And you sort of jerk it, and these fish will hide up underneath. This works great on locking walls uh, worldwide. Doesn't matter where it is; it could be any kinds of thing. Uh, the Great Lakes has huge canal-like systems, like here in different spots, right? Where uh, fish will sort of position themselves underneath these sorts of things and against them if there's little current breaks or any kinds of things like that, and. Uh, and just stay in the shade line sort of thing. You can see that there's a shade line here, right? And uh, these monster predators and all kinds of species will use this. Not not only muskies, uh, giant pike, uh, bass, walleyes, and uh, the list goes on and on. Saugers sometimes and different ones. So we might get lucky and get what one uh, here on film. I, I mean, I'm trying to do two shows at the same day. And it's a cold front with bright skies and... Uh, way lower amounts of fish than what there used to be <laughs> in the system due to the zebra mussels and a host of other things doesn't make it the most fun, right? But it, like I said, uh, as my hat says, uh, shut up and uh, stop the whining and fish, fish, right? You accept whatever is available in the water, right? Like, I mean, you can't make a 10-pound bass bite in the lake and no matter even if you fish 100, you know, 365 days a year, 24-7, if you were a robot, you still couldn't catch a bass that size if he doesn't exist in the water, right? So you, you have to put up with what's available, what's the sort of maximum sorts of things, right? So we'll work this a little bit. This is a terrible, like I said, not really good. It's supposed to cloud up a little bit. Maybe what I might do is walk down over there and cast a little bit and then, you know, come back and sort of if there's a little bit of a chop that comes on the water or anything like that, that'd be certainly helpful. They don't see it as well. They're more active and they're more likely to take a chance at it. Sort of thing. 
Now, you can see, one thing I hate about Suix, I, uh, I, since they can't have been, uh, sometimes I had to weight them and stuff like that, so I'll attach bell sinkers. This one was actually made for this sort of thing, uh, where it had a lead weight in it, but it fell out, uh, so I don't like the design. Uh, they started copying uh, yet, you know, all kinds of people that have been doing this. I, I'm not the only one that started waiting their baits. Uh, all kinds of people have done this over the years, right? For all kinds of species. But, uh, uh, for suix, sometimes that, or you can soak them just in water until they become almost like neutral buoyancy. This one's still floating, but it helps with the bell sinker to get it down sort of more. <laughs> And uh, it makes also a bit of a clonk. Uh, other things with suix that you want to do, and I've been fishing these since the late 60s, so a hell of a long time. I'm one of the earliest throwers of them in the business, right? So way before any of these swim lakes, or anything, like all these kinds of things, we, we've been doing these things a long time. What I like to do is sometimes I'll bend one sort of tail over the other, or I drill a hole through it and uh, make like a small little spinner uh, sort of thing uh, with uh, a better a sample or a crane swivel, or whatever is available, as long as the thing spin a little bit and he flashes around try and use a lighter blade as uh, sort of like that and small don't uh, yeah I, once you get to a certain size it sort of pushes it's weird with the bait and it may still trigger a fish and you might even get a bigger fish but it's just more difficult to work with right sort of thing so that that's another thing other things i like to do is i'll uh, attach uh, in the 70s and stuff like that when they started having all these uh, early vinyl skirts and all these kinds of like those uh, yeah, yeah you know like early living rubber ones and uh, these different ones as they came along uh, sort of thing like that I'd uh, attach them on the back too and make like a sort of a fluffy sort of stuff so I'd slide up and push them over these trebles put it back on and you got now three flashing sort of different colors that I'd make it like perch or sort of a white uh, ones like that right this bait here works well because of the yellow white color it looks a lot like walleyes and saugers and these kinds of ones uh, that, that they'll typically feed off of and it's the right size of a smaller one and it's big enough to attract even a monster as a snack, right? Sort of thing like that. So you want to give them different actions and things like that. But if you want it to sink neutral buoyancy, what you can do is you can just keep sort of waiting it in a, in a tub and sort of let it sink full of water and sort of things like that. And you can use like a coating over once you get the water in and it sinks a little bit. You can uh, <coughs> spray this weird plastic coating that will actually dry around it. They use it for raincoats. That's I, I just, by fluke, I decided to test this stuff on it. I don't know what it's called. I don't remember. I haven't bought in a bottle in years. Uh, but uh, normally, I don't need to do this. Moment, uh, who wrote the first snow and angling book? Big Jim Magoo? <laughs> uh, Ernest Hemingway? Uh, James Henshaw? Mo Halal? Betty Smith? Chris Houston, Bob Azumi, Red Fisher, Dame Julia Bernards, or Charles Dickens? Do, 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 Na, na, na. <laughs> so you got five, four, three, two, one. And the answer is Dame Julia Bernard's uh, Treaties of Angle, 1400s. Now, in this book, uh, as uh, the date got, got cut out there, but uh, it was in the 1400s. She mentions in the book Deaths from a Killer Pike, which we'll be discussing later. Uh, so uh, now back to the fish. <laughs> So uh, there's our uh, first uh, muskie of the day there, and uh, away we go. <laughs> so she's just scrapping away. Not a super mega giant, but uh, a muskie's a muskie. And it's still a beautiful creature. So uh, anyways, uh, uh, not the uh, seven-foot monsters we want, but <laughs> it'll do. So anyways, uh, stay tuned, and we'll continue on. Accomplished my job, right? Yeah.
Usually, if one's around, that's this sort of thing. I, I find usually within the first five minutes, quite often it's the first cast, two, three casts, five casts, 20 casts, somewhere in there, and then, yeah, you know, I'll get this thing eventually, right? If he's active and around, sort of, right? What I've got, I just stay with it and until one either moves in or they become active, right? Or sometimes, like I said, I call it torture fishing just by simply constantly going over the thing's head. If I don't know that he's there or not, but uh, he's sort of, yeah, you know, there could be one in this sort of area. Well, then eventually what happens is, is I bugged him so many times and he starts getting annoying. It's like somebody shooting at you, you know, you know a baseball or something constantly every second. Eventually you're going to try and do something about this, right? It's the same kind of principle, kind of... Okay. So, no action here. <coughs> but at least it's a nice day out. Uh, it's the interprovincial bridge that goes over into Quebec. Sort of thing like this. These are giant tires that they use to park boats and things like that. We have tourist boats down here if you want to check them out. Now, classic uh, pieces of cover here, like these docks and things like that. Uh, like I said, I always cast first on the more sort of not right beside it. There could be an aggressive fish that was pushed off by a bigger fish, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. And you, you might get, oh, yeah, there we go. Right on our right. <laughs> See that? So there we're into some action. Whee! It's uh, Esox Lucia Snake Northern Pike. Not the one we wanted, but he'll still do. <laughs> so there we go. Okay, so we'll, oh, geez. It's uh, sort of a wonky here. Not a good spot. Okay. We'll see if we can get him over this way. We'll just walk him up over the shore here. I just don't want to lift him up here because it's sort of... And I don't care if he falls off. He's not relented. <laughs> Maybe a giant one now will come along. do 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 Okay. So... Okay. So, at least here we can put him up on the dock, sort of if he plops around the woods wet and all that sort of thing. Okay, so we gotta be careful here because these guys are wild character. Okay, he's gonna jump. Calm down there, Scooby. This is what I, I really hate. There we go. Now, normally I wouldn't sort of, uh, okay. 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 There we go. Now we got him in a safe spot here. Oh, no. You gotta really be careful with Northern Pike because, oh, he's gonna be annoying. I'm trying to get right in there. There we go. Okay. Okay, alright. He's not, it's just for some reason his little mouth part there is green, but I think he'll be fine. Okay. So there we go. Ooh. Oh my goodness, that water is cold. Oh. Okay. Uh, and next year, we're going to be talking about an extinct, likely giant pike uh, species that was over 10 feet long. And so we're going to be discussing the mighty drag pike, okay? Uh, as well as uh, uh, we're going to discuss the Ottawa River's shark nest monster, whopper uh, of the week story, right? Now, this happened to me uh, before we get into the drag pike. In the 19, uh, uh, about 77, 78, somewhere in there, I was uh, uh, trolling with this fellow named Thomas, and uh, we were going back and forth uh, 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 trolling these uh, uh, Suix on a downrigger, and I was experimenting putting blades on the back of it and doing weird things with it, and I just wanted to see what kind of reactions I could get, and I was uh, trolling along this sort of uh, bridge uh, wall, and sort of, uh, I would bounce it up against the sort of pillars and the different sorts of things, the bridge abutments and that, and uh, sort of just working different back and forth and that sort of thing. And 
we we decided for a bit there because uh, 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 I wanted to uh, uh, see. I had uh, noticed that there was this hole a little bit further down where it drops off a little bit, and I noticed some large blimps near the bottom there. So I was wondering if there were catfish or that sort of thing like that. So we decided to just sort of uh, stop that for a bit and start fishing into this sort of a hole here for a bit. And anyways, I nailed this sort of a uh, catfish there and uh, get them up and a few a few more and that sort of thing like that. And I was still more in the mood just to keep experimenting things like that. So after catching a few of these, then uh, we were sitting there and on the depth finder, all of a sudden the whole screen, about three quarters of it, this giant sort of solid object i mean this was not a school of fish absolutely not and uh very shape similar to like a, a giant sturgeon like sort of a shape you would see on the screen and that sort of thing like that except this thing was way bigger than anything i had ever ran across and there was it was kind of hard to try and calculate exactly how really long this thing could be because I'd never seen one where it's almost covering the entire sort of screen every time it would come through, right? But this thing uh, would come, then he would go away and come back and forth and kept watching and watching us. What the heck is this? And so I'm telling my buddy, I said, man, look at the size of that compared to like the hooks of the ones that we had just seen of the catfish, right? And I mean, these were reasonable catfish, 10, 15 pound sort of channel cats. And, and I mean, they didn't even look like a, a, a zillionth of an inch compared to this thing, right? So I, I just never saw one so, so big. I'd already ran across a couple of weird anomalies before, but this was really strange. So, and he was going against current and he would vanish and then come back. So I knew it couldn't have been any kind of weird debris going in a circle or any kind of weird thing. It's not feasible, any of these sorts of things. So... I, I decided, I said, hey, man, I, I said, if this guy keeps coming and he seems to be about three, four feet up off the bottom when he's coming through like that. So uh, we decided to get the anchors off and I just kept trolling. And what I do is I, I lowered down this suic and uh, put it about three, four feet up above the bottom and kept trying and then going back and forth. And several times I went right over where I could tell that I was right, almost right on top of them somewhere, right? And so I would slow it down, speed it up, slow it down, speed it up. And I kept doing this time and time again, going around in a circle around this bridge. And after about seven, eight times of doing this, all of a sudden, bang, it releases, eh? I slam into this dude, this guy script completely almost, and this was a big, big, huge uh, sort of saltwater pen reel that I would use for trolling for muskies, and it had a, a, a heavy-duty sort, of, uh, a, a sort of rod on it, uh, older glass rod, and it was quite powerful, right? So, like, I mean, uh, this thing, you could reel in a shark or different sorts of things with this, and uh, so anyways, it, it, because it was more designed for saltwater like that. So, but at this, this one here, I had uh, sort of like, uh, it, it was glass, right? So it had a good bend to it in that uh, design for the sort of rigor and that sort of thing. But, but anyways, like this thing kept, towing us back and forth it went all the way down the river a little bit went back and forth back and forth back and forth the craziest like i mean uh, many many times the line almost completely was gone right out of it then it would come back up again and come back up and this guy actually came by and i asked him he was from some marina i said please i got this monster on whatever this thing is his jaws man like yeah you know sort of thing i, I can you get a camera right so uh, the the guy w went to take off to go do this and it was pulling us back and forth all over and then all of a sudden it just poof and release and I said oh, I can't be I can't be like this and I said man my hooks are so sharp I said I must have gotten really bad luck here and nailed them in a weird spot I'm bringing it up the suic was bit in half I've never seen, I have really, as you can see, there are 60 plus inch muskies on even some of the sort of slides that I have around here, uh, several of them, and that sort of thing like that, it, that I put on the shows, right? And so I've gotten them as big as like world record sort of sizes, sort of uh, ideas, what any human beings ever released out there or captured sort of thing. And, and many, many times here uh, over my lifetime, right? I've reeled in thousands and thousands of muskies. So... 
I have never seen one, including these big monsters that can barely make little bits of, yeah, you know, a certain amount of teeth marks in them, and that's it. But to bite one in half, where actually the the brass that's inside of it, this thing had bit through it in half. What could have done that? What was that, <laughs> right? So there was a shark that was actually captured uh, uh, quite a, several hundred miles away, but but still, not, not, not even some, I mean, close to that, but, but a, a fair distance, right? Uh, about 150 miles or so uh, further away sort of thing uh, uh, downstream. But, but the thing is, is that there was actually a, a, a five and a half foot lemon shark that was uh, uh, that actually died not because of the fresh water. It got stuck in a slough sort of idea, right? Sort of thing like this. And the only thing that in this universe, it couldn't have been a muskie. I mean, first of all, it was way bigger than any of these giant, you know, five, six foot approaching sort of fish that I've hooked sort of in this sort of thing. And, and, and I mean, they look small compared to whatever was on the screen, right? So that that's like uh, the most, whatever something bit a sui can have, right? So like, I mean, I, I, I just couldn't believe this. I just couldn't get over this, right? But this, it, it actually happened again another time. You were saying, we'll talk about that. Another with a different sort of a, a bait here. Uh, uh, with an interconnecting water system that uh, sir, uh, a similar like sort of thing, but this is that bait uh, could e easier be bitten through, sort of. Although, still, I've never seen any musk or pike do it. Uh, it's more feasible than what the suic was, right? So, whatever this thing was. There was some, and, and I've talked to divers down there that have claimed they've seen like seven, eight foot, uh, one guy cl claimed a 10 foot muskie, right? And this sort of thing like that. So if it was a muskie, he, he had to be way bigger than any of the known ones that I've ever ran across or any human beings ever sort of seen, right? <laughs> At least believable ones, right? But, but anyways, that's a true story that happened to me. I still have no explanation except that I presume it could have been a shark and because sharks have been found in this river system before it, it, that's maybe what it was right so I, I i don't know i i but it's one of those mysteries right but but next year we'll talk about where there's actual a photograph of this still in existence in the Derwood Lakes region of England which is about I think it's about 85 miles 65 miles of water lakes that are similar near attached to each other some rivers might pour one into the next and that sort of thing so the creature likely could get to the different ones by through the system right and that sort of thing like that but uh, besides this Derwood in England uh, Russia as well as Ireland France uh, Iceland, uh, Sweden, Italy, Serbia, Croatia, uh, Canada, to Alaska, stories of killer esocs. Now, most of them don't have uh, sort of what this uh, drag pike did, where a long, it had a long sort of hair on its back of its head, very similar like the horse-haired eels that you hear about uh, through Ireland, these different stories, and even Canada and different areas where some of them was a giant eel with this sort of long stringy sort of thing. Now, lots of people always think this is a myth, and, and, and in Ireland, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, sort of like, uh, especially in Italy, there's a, a place called Lake Majoria where these creature might still actually a similar like virgin, but still might exist. They claim that there's a pike there with this, uh, eyes the size of saucers and that some have beards on them. So this is very similar uh, to this Greg pike that we're going to be uh, uh, discussing here. Uh, that was mostly more in the England sort of region. However, a similar like creature was reported in Ireland uh, and with different sort of names. Some even have horns on them like the Cronagnum, uh, <laughs> sorry to pronounce some of these words and that sort of ones like that, but there was these different ones and, and still even to this date, uh, there's some bodies of water where they have these wild sort of uh, uh, tales like uh, uh, in uh, Sweden and, and, and different ones there in Iceland and different uh, uh, ones, right? And, and these sort of places where there's still these sort of crazy stories, but this is an actual factual real monster, 
okay? This fish was so huge that was blamed on killing people and attempting to uh, a much big, a bigger monsters typically existed in the past. Like, like here's an old giant that I got a massive moons ago, uh, uh, a sort of thing like that. There was less fishing back then, damming, pollution, uh, and it produced these bigger monsters, right? And this sort of thing like that. Uh, like the fish were fatter quite often and these and extraordinary size sort of beasts, right? But but uh, this a killer drag pike, uh, here's some authentic stories that are absolutely really terrifying, sort of interesting sort of thing. In 1815, a man from a, a carriage uh, fell into the river in the River Lou. Uh, they were going to celebrate the victory uh, over Napoleon, uh, sort of thing like this. And uh, so these guys were going back over this bridge and one of the guys fell off off of the back of the carriage and landed into water and all the witnesses saw this giant pike monster come out and had sort of hair on his uh, back again as usual, sort of thing like that grabbed the guy, the guy kept screaming and that sort of thing like that, and they found his remains later on uh, further down sort of stream. And uh, even more modern reports, in 1980, uh, a skier on Longhorse uh, uh, Lake was uh, attacked, and the guy was actually like a, a, a skiing ice fishing, and he went to go over this thinner sort of area and this pike sort of uh, kind of leap out and try and grab them <laughs> All right. sort of thing like this and there's Lake Bala and these different ones here where there's these monster sort of tales of these sort of 10 foot pike uh, Alaska's Lake Iliamana uh, different ones however this this one here is the only one that I can actually really find sort of conclusive sort of evidence to it uh, for several sort of things. Uh, a, there was numerous uh, stories here in the 1800s, there uh, three children were attacked and killed by a drag pike in Lake Windermere, okay, which is the uh, largest lake in, uh, in, in England. Uh, this uh, maid in Durham water, Okay, her name was Jane Boxall. Here she is, missing girl. She was witness out in front of one of the workers and then another side worker. She waited out. She had a bit of problems, like some kind of depression or whatever. So it's thought that maybe she was going to try and commit suicide. So she started walking out. And the, the worker worried about it, so he started following her out and got another guy to come with him. And all of a sudden, this giant 10-foot uh, sort of drag pike came out. This giant head came out, grabbed her sort of sideways and started dragging her off. Even a steamship further on uh, sort of had seen uh, this sort of attack and different sort of ones over the ages, right? So we're actually, whole groups actually watch the creature come up and attack and kill these people, right? And this and these three children were in this uh, Lake Windermere, which still has monster reports to this date, were actually like all three of them were eaten right in front of a couple and, and other sort of things that were going by, right? That the numerous uh, witnesses, right? Uh, even a priest later came over there to sort of uh, exercise sort of the place where Jane Boxall had went in and uh, uh, sort of been something swirled around him and he vanished and he never recovered from the shock. They were able to collect him in time, but whatever it was, something splashed, made a big, and they, they thought it was a drag pike again that in the same area that made a swish at him. Uh, but he just died a natural war, like just because he drowned, right? But something had made a big swirl around him in that particular time, right? But the other witnesses actually really... The people saw this, like the, the creature, right? Uh, numerous workers also in the Durham water, uh, later 1800s there, uh, they uh, were working trying to, uh, they were going to dam and make this sort of extra water system and all that sort of thing. And this rivers down below it, the guys were working on the dam area. They all fell in a pile of them and piles of them started getting attacked by these ferocious monsters that were 10 foot plus on them. Some of the guys escaped and they actually had titanic teeth marks all through their whole legs, like way bigger than any muskie or any kind of thing, like inches, inches long here. Absolutely terrifying sort of thing like this. Uh, most of them didn't survive, but some did escape and, and had the giant teeth marks in them and this sort of thing. And this is all like verified stuff. And if you don't believe it, this is in the museum. Some of its still scales exist. Here it is. 
right there. This in 1895, Lake Windermere in the first time in ages that was known had actually frozen. And one of these drag pike actually got stuck. And when the people were going by, they said, what's that? And they started digging around it and they found them. And here he was stuck in it. Now, clearly you can see that this pike is way bigger than any pike or muskie sock species ever known on this planet. Okay. Uh, now, some people tried to claim it was a catfish. Uh, it, it, there is catfish species that do have teeth, okay, and that sort of thing. However, uh, the only known European one, it was a, a Solaris glanus there, uh, uh, okay, uh, elves, giant elves, wells, catfish, I, I, I pronounce it, sometimes I'll say wells, but it's elves, actually, how you're supposed to pronounce it, but, but they don't have anything like this whatsoever. This is completely a giant esox of some sort that probably is extinct, but this, you can clearly see in the front of the teeth, you can see the flap uh, on, on the side of his jaw here, exactly like any Esox has, okay? Uh, the adipose fin here, uh, sort of in the back, the caudal fins uh, similar uh, uh, to sort of thing like this. It seems that uh, because the creature is so titanic, their adipose fin sort of is more sort of a... Uh, a bit more forward than typically. That could be just because of the massive length of the creature or whatever, right? So, uh, part, but, but I mean, uh, uh, all these sort of things here. Now, some reports claim that the back of these sort of creatures had two legs, right? However, I don't see this in this photo. So as far as I, I don't know about these things, it could be that they had large uh, sort of, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, uh, anal sort of fin area, some sort, or uh, and pelvic fins and pectoral fins. What what so what could give this kind of illusion maybe somehow that the the person thought that. However, some accounts the creatures walked up on shore. So either two things, either there was another creature that I seen another photograph that does not look exactly like this. However. This real drag pike certainly existed because they actually buried it in a lime thing. The, uh, of course, big business was worried that all these people were, they didn't want the smell of it because it was started to thaw out. So they made them remove it and they buried it in a lime pit, but they did take its hair-like substance that was up on the top and actually had it to the museum. And it was very well verified. It's in the uh, original newspapers at the time. This is not a plastic wooden carving whatsoever. I can 100% guarantee you that was a living creature that you have on film uh, picture here, right? So could you imagine, I would do anything if there was a time machine, if I could go back before this water froze and hunt this dude, this would be the most insane thing to me on earth. Like, uh, because I mean, e even though yes, they killed people and even attacked sort of thing like that, this creature should have been still kept, uh, it's not likely doesn't exist anymore. There's still stories from Ireland of crazy ones that have beards or different things. Once in a while you'll get from different countries. I even collected this from Canada here, uh, devil horde ones. Uh, uh, one apparently had hair on his head uh, from the actual Ottawa River. So, I mean, even these... But what I suspect that none of these were titanic like this sort of thing, right? <clears throat> these are authentic things that were in at this time. This here, uh, to me, is astonishing uh, viable evidence that, yes, a titanic unknown species of pike once existed. <coughs> uh, <coughs> at least in this Durham water region. The other ones, it's hard to know. There's still these stories. Uh, I've never seen any proof of a pike, uh, anything up to around near the six foot mark is about quasi as you can sort of get, right? However, this is the ultimate. This is not an Esox Lucius, no way. It can't be an Esox Masconage, uh, uh, no sort of way, unless that there was some kind of extinct Esox Masconage relative or whatever, right? Like some even bigger boss that we didn't know of that was in very small numbers. The, uh, the uh, uh, early writers wrote about them, uh, even the earliest ladies that were going through England around the 16th, 17th century. A few of them mentioned these drag pike, uh, like I, I mentioned Julia, uh, 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 Julia Bernard's there. She mentions a whole bunch of children, adults, 
uh, and everything killed by these drag pike. So you thought it was all mythology. This is not mythology. Here it is, uh, right in the sort of a uh, museum. I uh, hear Lake Windermere, Westmoreland, uh, British. Uh, the frozen matter find, right, and that sort of thing like this. Uh, that's that's what it was, right? And as I mean, astonishing. You can clearly see that that fish is way big enough to easily eat, eat a human. And and sadly, the last reports known of any decent proof is about 1920s. However, there's reports after and even missing people along some of these waterways. Maybe this thing actually still exists, right? And I've even had this happen to myself, like I said on the shows here. Uh, this happened to me years ago. I saw a muskie at least six foot plus range on it that attacked and this muskie as it was bringing it in. You can see this giant uh, pike from Longworth Lake there that they estimate at least was about five feet long. This, this guy was actually bit right, something bit his whole head right off, just snapping one bite. I mean, what on earth could really do that? You'd think you'd be safe at a five foot, right? So uh, maybe these drag pike or a similar like version of it still exist because in some of these bodies of water, there's the odd tail where the creature had like hair or a hairy eel or this. Maybe it was one of these drag pike and they thought it was an eel because they're thin, right? And long sort of a creature, right? So who knows, right? But But the thing is, is that at one time, at one time, this thing actually really existed. I mean, unbelievable. This is the greatest. Could you imagine if that giant pike species unknown to science still exists? Could you imagine what, what a thrill that that would be on a rod and reel? What, how, what kind of a battle that that would be, right? I, I Anyways, if it is uh, some kind of bizarre sort of unknown catfish species that had sort of developed teeth or whatever, and this sort of thing like this, it's certainly not the only known one there, The uh, you, you know, of a giant species, the uh, glanus here. So it can't be ales, and, and, uh, but to me it looks... A completely, I can see the jawline here, all this sort of thing, the, the teeth are curved in lock like a normal Esox would be, a uh, sort of thing like that. The uh, uh, fin structure, everything's very similar uh, to a Titanic uh, Esox, not a catfish species. So uh, I, I would say 99.999% that this is a unknown species of giant Esox that existed or may still do uh, sort of a, at this time uh, that was in this Lake Windermere, right? Certain thing like that. So that's all I can say, but I, I'm telling you, most astonishing sort of wild big fish story where you actually have real proof of it. Uh, there's uh, still uh, uh, whole things about it in the museum. They had studied the hairs and they said they were fish scales, so it was for sure a fish, right? And you can clearly see, like I said, if any person, I'm sure even most, uh, yeah, you know, any any person who knows about muskies and pike or different ones, if you were looking at this, you would more garner this towards a Esox sort of relative than what you would uh, sort of a catfish, okay? Yeah, I, I don't see any sort Sort of whiskers on here. Typically, most catfish do not have teeth, certainly not deep like that. Uh, they don't have a jawline like that typically. And this uh, jawline is much more like V shaped, like sort of like any sort of typical pike, any Esox predator from small chain and redfin pickerel to the, the monster Esox masconage, right? Sort of thing like that. So <laughs> I would say that. You know, this was some kind of unknown species. Uh, maybe this cold weather actually killed off the last few of them that there were. Some climatic change or just overfishing. Uh, who knows? Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, introduction of different species. Maybe they started eating these rarer sort of fishes, eggs. Who knows? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to know, right? But but still, giants exist. Uh, of these stories uh, from the Danube. Uh, River Re, Lake Majoria, uh, Alaska's Lake Iliamana still has these stories and that sort of thing like that. So who knows, maybe a, a relative of this or even this crazy thing still actually might uh, uh, still exist. So, <laughs> so anyways, uh, we'll, we'll get back to uh, to uh, some more uh, not as big monsters here, but we'll get back to the show. So uh, stay tuned. So, folks, uh, there we go. 
another northern pikey here on our sick <laughs> so it's musky a pike uh, this kind of thing in the fall right so anyways just a little fart we'll let her dance around here maybe another giant one like i've had in the past still come along here but i don't want to hurt it so we'll, we'll let her go here in a second i wouldn't be using it for bait but but uh anyways i, I just wanted to show you here uh, sadly the camera uh thing this morning there uh it's uh, a bit malfunctioning it keeps messing it up so we'll, we'll have to film this sort of way so anyway stay tuned it's uh, next question break there. Uh, sorry, we had a little bit of problems. Uh, uh, this is the first time I was attempting sort of one of these sort of to put them together. And the odd little thing word got cut out here and there, <laughs> that sort of thing. So the previous time we were trying to do, do the, uh, you know, trivia sort of question. So here's another one. Uh, who wrote the uh, Book of the Black Bass? Uh, Tony Portencaso, Wayne Azumi. Debbie Fields, Omar Akbara, <laughs> and uh, J or James Henshaw. Do 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 bum 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 Okay, and the answer is James Henshaw. <laughs> so uh, that's the uh, about the first original sort of fully dedicated bass sort of book, right? Sort of thing like that. So it's interesting, straight uh, harder sort of English to read and that sort of thing like that. But but anyways, uh, it, it's a, a fun old book and that sort of uh, thing like that. So uh, next show though will be fully uh, focused on uh, fishing. Uh, so, and the introduction will be changed slightly a little bit and some other little, but, but basically it'll be like this uh, a, uh, thing. And uh, it, it won't be as much of these sorts of things. It'll be strictly more filming and that sort of thing like that with stops for trivia and different sort of uh, things like that. But and other shows there will be covering all kinds of uh, things from dollar store uh, spinner baits to uh, uh, you know spoons and jigs and uh, plastic worms and all, all kinds of different various sort of uh, ways of using them and these kinds of things right so cover a lot of sort of uh, uh, things there but uh, uh, this one was a bit of a editing sort of weird because sadly once we cropped it something it did something to the original file so I messed it up a little bit <laughs> but anyway, we put it together, managed to successfully do it. Uh, so, but anyways, uh, the other one's word is sort of like, because uh, a lot of street filming, sadly, these cameras, uh, because it was totally based on a dollar store, like budgetary sort of thing, right? The cameras are sort of really low quality here. And uh, I had to use a dollar store like modified component to be able to actually film with this to make it like a GoPro kind of thing. So I created this uh, out of a bit of ingenuity and this sort of thing. And uh, so the, the odd times it's shaky or different things. But the whole idea of it is, is, is to show you that even when you have, uh, you know, going into a dollar store and you're some guy like Chi Chi Rodriguez in the hood when he was young, he used to practice uh, with uh, sort of rocks and, and knock the sort of into holes in the, the concrete around and that sort of thing and nothing stopped him. And that's the same sort of thing. So uh, I built my empire living around sort of hood like areas, winning tons of tournaments. The uh, I, I started winning so many that adults uh, were banging banking on me 100% winning so they would actually uh, get me to enter with them uh, in sort of bigger sort of tournaments and we'd split the prize money and that sort of thing before I was legally allowed to drive right <laughs> and these kinds of things that I would do this weekend after weekend right and these kinds of uh, things like that so uh, I cover a lot of sort of uh, things like that but 
it's uh, through the history and the next show there, uh, a lot of historic sort of legends that influenced me from the 60s on and that sort of thing. And even earlier sort of things that I read uh, uh, from previous times and that sort of thing like that. So it, it's a good show too, because it has a lot of sort of famous sort of uh, legendary anglers that you, you would recognize or maybe not know, but or have forgotten or if you're a younger new bass master and uh, only familiar with uh, Ike and Ellie or somebody, well then uh, uh, for sure then you'll learn a lot from that sort of show as well. Uh, uh, in fact, though, my major idol, uh, the King of Bass, that no matter what anybody says, I know some people have surpassed some of his sort of things, but but I mean, to me, they sort of, they weren't competing against him really, so that's you're competing against sort of a, a lot lesser sort of grade at different eras, right? It depended on the era, right? But like I wanted in the 60s because I watched the first Bassmasters as it came out. I read their first magazines. There was a guy down the street and he would sit there and give them to me after and he was one of their earliest subscribers that they had. And so I read it from its inception. Uh, uh, they, uh, you know, watched every sort of uh, Bassmasters one that it came on, right? saw all the legends when they first appeared everybody from Roland to all the gang and Roland was sort of like the king to me right so I mean even though there's other people I, I cover about him were actually because I went to visit uh, to see him I had tried like three different times to see this guy and each time I couldn't run across him right when I'd go visit his sort of marinas and different things like that but I wouldn't have went on this trip if it hadn't have been because I wanted to see him I had heard he was going to be down at his marina so I wanted to go go this uh, to go down and see him and, and the previous time down in a marina and one other time at a tournament and that sort of thing and because of that, uh, I, I ended up with a few other people that assisted me, uh, ending up saving two children's lives. So uh, Roland Martin, if it hadn't been for his influence on me, I, I read his stuff right from his inception. I, I thought he was a genius. He stood out more than the rest of them, right? Sort of thing like that. The only other guy that I revere as much as sort of in a different way would be Al Linder, right? And, the, and I also enjoyed certainly Ron. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, as a tiny little child, when they first started doing their first seminars, uh, I was uh, already sitting in there demanding my, my parents let me sit there for hours and watch these uh, constantly and listening to these guys, yet I'm a tiny little kid. Nobody else done that would do such things, right? Like every other kid, somebody, the parent, Uncle Joe, brought them out fishing this did not occur with me. I actually made my family laugh. There was no spot exactly. We were pretty far from water, sort of in uh, Arizona. And uh, I just walked out of this room. I could already walk by the age of six, like uh, I made six months here. I was extremely sort of... Uh, fast at lots of sort of things like that fully competent on my own by the age of two pretty well like of every sort of thing right like doing any kind of thing you could lots of sorts of things i started making fishing lures by the age of four <laughs> right sort of thing like that and 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 all these sorts of things i started fishing by two but when i came out the store at two years of age I uh, said to them, I said, uh, I want to be a professional fisherman. And they all roared laughing. I thought this was the craziest thing. And I kept pestering them that I wanted to, uh, you know, get fishing equipment and all this sort of thing. So they brought me, uh, we, we ended up moving uh, from there to Chicago. <coughs> and... Uh, we ended up uh, going to the sportsman show and I saw early legends and that sort of thing like that. And they were bored out of their minds. They didn't know anything about this, but I started learning from the greatest legends in the business right instantly. Nobody understands why I did this. I had no, none of my family liked fishing, but they made sure every weekend besides me living besides water all my life, 
that I was on the weekends uh, and could travel all through the sort of summer months and all these sorts of places all around that every weekend that I could hit some kind of tournament with people or they'd uh, have these cottages and different things like that that we could fish of all kinds of things and also investigate water monster reports. <laughs> so so my life is like the strangest sort of thing in the universe because like no normal kid back in my sort of era, I could actually on the weekends when we didn't have a boat with us and things like that, you could go to these places and I, even at the ages of four and five, these people would actually rent me a motorboat and rowboats and things like that. You'd give the guy 20 bucks for the day or whatever it was, that, uh, these kinds of things. It was a lot less money back in the day, right? <laughs> sort of thing. But you would give this uh, guy the cash. But back then, they didn't really, nobody was, you know, five million visa cards and all these kinds of things. It wasn't as secure, right? So Uncle Joe would do this and the guy would, uh, they'd say, well, well yeah, uh, this kid can't rent it. And then my mom and uh, the, the family would explain, no, no, watch this guy in action, right? And so instantly then the guy would see that. So after watching me for five minutes, zooping around and uh, stand, uh, and casting all over the place and seeing how sort of professional I already was, right? Then they would sort of do this. And I actually started fishing contests. They would allow me to do this at an extremely young age. You couldn't do these things now so nobody could do what I did in those areas right? a sort of thing like that and I fished around the clock and sort of lived by water would sneak out my windows in the middle of the night and all sorts so my history is pretty wild which is mixed in with the history of bass there you'll get to see some historic things about me and different things so anyways uh, I uh, hopefully you enjoyed even though the uh, editing was a bit out there uh, but anyways I, I think we figured out some of the problems there and that sort of thing and uh, also how to design them a little bit better and that sort of thing so uh, anyways uh, the uh, next one there uh, uh, will, will be about the bass and different ones will cover all kinds of uh, things from uh, uh, different sort of presentations of everything from working grass lines to swamp like sort of things and flipping pitching all, all kinds of different things that we cover so anyways uh, uh, stay tuned for uh, next show uh, so please subscribe again uh, because because like I said, I, I don't, it takes me a while to put these together and that sort of thing like that. But we got some incredible fish on film, lots of uh, tons of uh, uh, sort of things. And in the further shows, I much more cover things. And this one, it was a bit lighter of a presentation because I had all this historic giant drag pike and all the other things to put in here and about the pollution, that sort of thing. So anyways, uh, stay tuned. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, bye for now.